You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. What's something you learned in history class that you feel like wasn't the whole truth? Better yet, what's something you didn't learn at all that was omitted completely? That's what I like to call redacted history. My name is Andre White, the host of the Redacted History Podcast, the place where history's forgotten events, heroes, and villains get their story told, one episode at a time. The Redacted History Podcast. Real history never dies. Stream the Redacted History Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to episode number 139 of our Civil War podcast. I'm Rich. And I'm Tracy. Hello y'all. Welcome to the podcast. With this show, we're going to continue with Stonewall Jackson's story, which we're covering because we think it's really interesting and hope that you do too. But it's also going to lead us up to the spring and early summer of 1862 and Jackson's famous Valley Campaign. With the last episode, we flew low and fast through the story of Thomas Jonathan Jackson's life and ended the show with a day in April 1861 when Jackson left Lexington with a contingent of 176 Virginia Military Institute cadets leading them to Richmond, where the young men were to act as drill masters for the raw recruits volunteering to fight for the Old Dominion in the Civil War that had just begun. Jackson and the VMI cadets arrived in Richmond on the night of April 22, 1861, and several days later, Thomas Jackson received an appointment as a colonel in Virginia State Forces. The next day, he was told that he was to take command at Harper's Ferry, a place of great strategic value at the northeast corner of the Shenandoah Valley, where the Shenandoah and Potomac Rivers converge in turbulent splendor. As you guys will recall, we've talked about Harper's Ferry before, most notably in connection with John Brown's raid on the place in 1859. But then in 1861, after the bombardment of Fort Sumter, a mob of Virginia volunteers and militia swarmed into Harper's Ferry on the evening of April 18th to drive off its 44-man federal garrison and take control of the place, which not only contained the important U.S. Armory, or arms manufacturing plant, but the town was also located on one of the Union's key railroad lines, not to mention that just across the way was the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal. While many people considered Harper's Ferry to be the geographical key to the Shenandoah Valley, that distinction actually belonged to Winchester. Nevertheless, Harper's Ferry could lay claim to being the northernmost outpost in the Confederacy. Both sides in the war became a bit infatuated with the fact that Harper's Ferry was actually northwest of Washington, D.C. But any good field officer would immediately discern that Harper's Ferry was an almost impossible place to defend. The town snuggled in a hollow formed by mountains on three sides and artillery placed on those surrounding heights could blast Harper's Ferry and everything in it to pieces. At the start of the Civil War, Virginia authorities overlooked this vulnerability and set about garrisoning the place. When Jackson arrived at Harper's Ferry, he found about 2,500 men assembled there, a mixture of green recruits who had volunteered for Virginia State Forces and excited local militia units from the nearby area that had shown up to take part in the fun all led by an assortment of brilliantly clad militia officers, including one major general and three brigadiers, despite the fact that organization didn't exist beyond 100-man companies. Into this tangle of inexperience and pomposity came Colonel Jackson. Dressed in his plain, well-worn blue uniform jacket, with a faded cap tilted down over his eyes, he seemed a sorry substitute for the gaudily ornamented figures he was succeeding. A newspaper correspondent spent a few minutes in Jackson's presence and concluded, quote, The Old Dominion must be sadly deficient in military men if this is the best she can do, 
He is nothing like a commanding officer. There is a painful want in him of the pride, pomp, and circumstances of glorious war. His air is abstracted, his bearing stiff and awkward, and he says little to anyone. End quote. The showy nonsense that Jackson found upon his arrival at Harper's Ferry was abruptly terminated by an act of the Virginia General Assembly, which removed all militia officers above the rank of captain and made their post available to gubernatorial appointees, of whom Colonel Jackson was one. John D. Imboden, then an artillery captain, had just returned to Harper's Ferry from a brief visit to Richmond, and he recalled, quote, What a revolution three or four days had wrought. The deposed officers had nearly all left for home or for Richmond in a high state of indignation. Imboden noted that soon enough, quote, The presence of a mastermind was visible in the changed condition of the camp. Perfect order reigned everywhere. Instruction in the details of military duties occupied Jackson's whole time. He was the easiest man in our army to get along with pleasantly so long as one did his duty but inexorable as fate in exacting the performance of it. End quote. Jackson spent seven hours a day drilling his green troops and also found time for them to work fortifying the rugged heights that surrounded Harper's Ferry. That newspaper correspondent Rich referenced just a moment ago may have missed the mark in evaluating Thomas Jackson's leadership potential, but he hit the nail on the head when he noted that Jackson was a man of few words. The newspaper man may have been the first, but wasn't the last observer during the war to remark upon Jackson's silence. He never shared his thoughts if there was an alternative, and if there was no other way, he said no more than absolutely essential. One man said that, quote, if silence be golden, he was a bonanza. Here at Harper's Ferry, Jackson first displayed an obsession for secrecy that was to become notorious. This strong tendency toward silence demonstrated Jackson's desire to, in his words, mystify, mislead, and surprise the enemy, but it often mystified, misled, and surprised his own forces as well, which would lead to confusion and missed opportunities down the road when his own subordinates had no clue as to Jackson's intentions and goals. Even his wife wasn't exempt from Jackson's obsession for secrecy. At Harper's Ferry, when Anna Jackson became curious about her husband's activities, he wrote in gentle rebuke, quote, What do you want with military news? Don't you know that it is unmilitary and unlike an officer to write news respecting one's post? You wouldn't wish your husband to do an unofficer-like thing, would you? Like his speech, Jackson strove to make his discipline the tightest in the Confederacy. He had a mania for enforcement of regulations, and he probably court-martialed more offenders than any other officer of the Confederate Army. He expected everyone to follow orders without delay, question, or comment. He would instruct the commander of a disorderly regiment to, quote, arrest any man who leaves his post and prefer charges and specifications against him that he may be court-martialed. It will not do to say that your men cannot be induced to perform their duty. They must be made to do it. End quote. Though Jackson's obsession for secrecy struck many at Harper's Ferry as odd, and his mania for discipline was a shock to the raw troops after the carnival-like atmosphere that had prevailed before his arrival, nevertheless they could see the worth in it. In fact, the strategic value of their post at Harper's Ferry seemed to demand it. The town was situated on the main line of the B&O, the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, an important railroad running between the Midwest and the East Coast. Thousands of tons of coal from Appalachian mines were carried eastward daily along the vital stretch of tracks. At Harper's Ferry, the line crossed the Potomac, leaving Virginia and entering the border state of Maryland on its way to Baltimore and Washington. Jackson, not surprisingly, was offended by the sight and sound of vital supplies rolling by on their way north, especially at night when he was trying to sleep. To complicate matters, however, the trains were also transporting goods from Maryland, which, as Tracy just mentioned, was a crucial border state that the Confederate government didn't wish to offend. The commander of Virginia's military forces, Robert E. Lee, 
cautioned Jackson about this very matter. On May 12th, Lee wrote, quote, I am concerned at the feeling evinced in Maryland. If possible, confine yourself to a strictly defensive course, end quote. But to Jackson, the words, if possible, seemed to permit him to exercise his discretion, which he proceeded to do forthwith. To lay a groundwork for action, Jackson in mid-May registered an official complaint with the B&O Railroad, charging that his men found, quote, their repose disturbed, end quote, by the trains passing through Harper's Ferry at night. In response, B&O officials began limiting their freight runs through Jackson's domain to the daylight hours. Next, Jackson protested that the daytime traffic was interfering with his periods of drill and instruction, and he demanded that the B&O trains traverse his lines only between 11 a.m. and 1 p.m. After this development, John Imboden reported that, quote, We then had, for two hours every day, the liveliest railroad in America, end quote. Then Jackson moved. When the tracks were crowded with heavily laden trains, his troops suddenly sealed off both ends of a 32-mile stretch of tracks, seizing 56 locomotives and more than 300 cars. We should point out that Jackson biographer James I. Robertson, Jr., believes this story with regard to the seizure of the B&O locomotives and rolling stock is fictional, made up out of whole cloth by Imboden. Although Robertson admits that writers over the past century have delighted in recounting it as fact. At any rate, among the plunder gathered in an actual seizure of an eastward bound B&O train was an unexpected bonus. Packed onto a freight car with other horses and headed for a life of anonymous toil with the Union Army was a runty, lusterless brown gelding that for some reason struck Jackson's fancy. He at first intended the horse as a gift for Anna, and he scrupulously counted out its purchase price to his quartermaster. But before he could present the pint-sized steed to his wife, Thomas Jackson grew so fond of it that he adopted it as his own mount. Even though Little Sorrel, like his master, wasn't much to look at, he nevertheless possessed a seemingly inexhaustible supply of energy, and so was the perfect steed for a commander who built his reputation on outmaneuvering the enemy. At a walk, Little Sorrel had a slow gait that Jackson appreciated as, quote, easy as the rocking of a cradle. But the horse could take off with surprising speed when pushed. William T. Pogue, a battery commander under Jackson, remembered Little Sorrel, quote, could make a mile in about 240, and whenever we saw him, it was either at this tremendous stride or at a slow, lazy walk, end quote. It was common, said Pogue, to see Jackson sweep by on Little Sorrel, quote, at his best speed, the staff strung out away behind, doing their level best to keep up, end quote. Henry Kai Douglas added, quote, such endurance I have never seen in horse flesh. We had no horse at headquarters that could match him. I never saw him show a sign of fatigue. End quote. It got so that Jackson's staff officers breathed a sigh of relief when he would rest Little Sorrel and ride a replacement mount, for they knew an easier day lay ahead. At any rate, perhaps only Robert E. Lee's magnificent gray, Traveler, was to become better known than Little Sorrel as a war horse during the Civil War. At Harper's Ferry, Jackson, having stretched his mandate in the matter of interfering with the traffic of the B&O, now reverted back to correct behavior, since as part of the Confederacy's assumption of military authority over state forces, Brigadier General Joseph E. Johnston of the Confederate Army arrived to take command from Colonel Jackson of the Virginia Volunteers. However, Jackson had received no official notification of the change, and Johnston had brought none with him. That being the case, Jackson courteously but firmly refused to turn over the reins of command. The impasse was resolved only when Johnston rummaged about in his papers and finally found a document signed in Lee's name by Lee's aide-de-camp, which referred to, quote, General J.E. Johnston, commanding officer at Harper's Ferry. The episode could have led to tension between the two officers, but Johnston, himself a stickler for proper procedure, held no hard feelings. 
Instead, he quickly appointed Jackson to command one of the three brigades he was forming for what he christened the Army of the Shenandoah. Fearing that his force of about 8,000 men would be outflanked by 18,000 Federals under Robert Patterson, who were threatening the line of the Potomac, Joe Johnston in mid-June ordered a withdrawal to Winchester, 30 miles southwest of Harper's Ferry. Jackson, commanding the 1st Brigade, was dispatched to Martinsburg, though, 20 miles northwest of Harper's Ferry, with orders to destroy all the B&O rolling stock he could lay his hands on. Near Martinsburg, Jackson would link up with Lieutenant Colonel Jeb Stewart, a young cavalry officer who was already establishing a reputation for being both capable and dashing. Jackson was delighted by the opportunity to do harm to the enemy, and as always when he was campaigning, his physical ailments vanished. He wrote Anna, telling her, quote, I am bivouacking. I sleep out of doors without any cover except my bedding, but have not felt any inconvenience from it in the way of impaired health, end quote. He would have felt even better if he had known he would soon give the Yankees a bloody nose. Did archaeologists discover Noah's Ark? Is the rapture coming as soon as the Euphrates River dries up? Does the Bible condemn abortion? Don't you wish you had a trustworthy academic resource to help make sense of all of this? Well, I'm Dan Beecher, and he's award-winning Bible scholar and TikTok sensation Dr. Dan McClellan. And we want to invite you to the Data Over Dogma podcast. Where our mission is to increase public access to the academic study of the Bible and religion, and also to combat the spread of misinformation about the same. But, you know, in a fun way. Every week we tackle fascinating topics, we go back to source materials in their original languages, and we interview top scholars in the field. So whether you're a devout believer, or you're just interested in a clear-eyed, deeply informed look at one of the most influential books of all time, we think you're going to love the Data Over Dogma podcast, wherever you subscribe to awesome shows. Hey y'all, spooky season is here, and if you're looking for a show to whet your appetite for a little haunted history, then I'd like to invite you to check out Southern Gothic, a chart-topping history podcast that explores some of the most infamous legends, folklore, ghost stories, and hauntings of the American South. We've covered all sorts of stuff from the Bell Witch of Tennessee to the disappearance of the Confederate submarine, the H.L. Hunley. Not to mention our deep dives into the local lore of some of America's oldest and most haunted cities like New Orleans, Charleston, and St. Augustine. So if you're ready for a little good old-fashioned Halloween storytelling with a commitment to quality historical research, then be sure to check out Southern Gothic today. It's available now on all your favorite podcast apps. Early on July 2, 1861, Patterson's Union troops streamed across the Potomac north of Martinsburg at Williamsport under the watchful eye of Jeb Stuart. By 7.30 that morning, a hard-riding courier had brought the news from Stuart to Jackson outside Martinsburg. Jackson's orders from Joe Johnston had been most explicit. Jackson was to determine the enemy's strength, and if Patterson was advancing in force, Jackson was to fall back as far as need be, for under no circumstances was he to become involved in a general engagement. So Jackson decided to conduct a reconnaissance in force to determine the enemy's strength, and within minutes, Colonel Kenton Harper's 5th Virginia, which was known within the brigade as the Fighting 5th because of its brawling in camp, was marching toward Falling Waters, the site of a country church about five miles south of Williamsport. Jackson himself would accompany the regiment, and Colonel Harper would be supported by a battery of light artillery under Captain William N. Pendleton, a West Pointer who had turned clergyman and become pastor of Lexington's Episcopal Church. Near Falling Waters, Federal skirmishers came probing forward along both sides of a highway and were taken under sharp and unexpected fire by Confederates partly concealed in woods. The blue-clad skirmishers recoiled, 
and some brash young rebels who had taken cover in a house in a barn started to give chase, but Jackson called them back. It was a good thing Jackson recalled them, for by now the Yankee skirmishers had reformed, and followed by two regiments of infantry, were coming on with a rush. The time had arrived for Jackson to obey orders and avoid a pitched battle. So keeping his men in line, he began a reluctant retreat. The inexperienced Federals, concluding mistakenly that the rebels were defeated, sent a column racing down the highway in pursuit. At this point, a well-placed shot from one of Pendleton's guns sent the Federals flying back toward falling waters in disarray. Later, Jackson's men said gleefully that just before firing, the Reverend Pendleton had raised his eyes to heaven and pronounced a benediction on the enemy, saying, May the Lord have mercy on their souls. Fire! Meanwhile, Stuart and his cavalry had split off to attempt a flank attack on the Yankees. Stuart, in the confusion, lost contact with his own troopers and, riding alone, sighted a sizable group of Union infantrymen. Like many another Confederate officer in those early days of the Civil War, Stuart was still wearing his old U.S. Army uniform. Thus disguised, he approached the Federal soldiers as if he were one of them and then shouted suddenly, "'Throw down your arms, or you are all dead men!' The startled Yankees not only obeyed, but flung themselves flat on their faces. At that point, Stuart's men rode up and helped their commander collect 49 prisoners. By the time the little action was done, Jackson had fallen back to Big Spring, two and a half miles south of Martinsburg, where Patterson had prudently halted. In his first confrontation with the enemy, Jackson found cause for satisfaction his troops had inflicted about an equal number of casualties as the two dozen men he had lost. Moreover, he had ably coordinated the actions of his infantry and artillery and had earned the admiration of his men by showing not the slightest trace of a flinch when a cannonball had smashed into a tree beside him. He wrote to Anna, saying, quote, I am very thankful that an ever-kind providence made me an instrument in carrying out General Johnston's orders so successfully. End quote. As for Patterson, he reported that he had been opposed by a force numbering 3,500, many times Jackson's actual number at Falling Waters. It was just the first of many occasions when Jackson's aggressiveness would persuade a federal commander to greatly overestimate his numerical strength. The brush with Jackson would be more than enough to keep the cautious Patterson at a respectful distance. A few days later, Jackson rejoined Johnston near Winchester, where he found awaiting him a commission as Brigadier General in the Confederate Army. On the morning of July 18th, Johnston received alarming news by way of Richmond from PGT Beauregard. Beauregard's Confederate army was drawn up near Manassas Junction, some 60 miles southeast of Winchester, and he was being threatened by the advancing Union force led by Irvin McDowell. Joe Johnston immediately ordered his Valley Army to move out. By about noon, the men were on the road, with Brigadier General Jackson's 1st Brigade in the lead spot. The day was hot, the road was dusty, and this was the first of the grueling marches for which Jackson and his troops would become famous. But the start was less than auspicious. Since they were marching southeast, the men were frustrated and disappointed at the thought of turning their backs on the Union force led by Patterson. After an hour and a half of grumbling, though, Jackson's brigade was called to a halt to hear an officer read a message from Johnston. The message told them that Beauregard's force was threatened by an advancing Union army, and that as they were being called upon to go to Beauregard's rescue, quote, the commanding general hopes that his troops will step out like men and make a forced march to save the country, end quote. By all accounts, the effect of that announcement was electric. Jackson later wrote that, quote, The soldiers rent the air with shouts of joy, and all was eagerness and animation, where before there had been only lagging and uninterested indifference. Swinging out in a new stride, the 1st Brigade marched 11 miles to Millwood, where it briefly paused for food and rest. Later, in the gathering dusk, the men waded across the waist-deep Shenandoah River. Then, in the darkness, they moved up the western slope of the Blue Ridge and through Ashby's Gap. 
Finally, at two o'clock in the morning, they halted at the village of Paris on the eastern side of the mountains. In fourteen hours, Jackson's soldiers had covered almost twenty steep and rugged miles. It was an exceptional performance for troops inexperienced in such road marches. Utterly exhausted, the troops collapsed in their tracks. Legend has it that Jackson, making the rounds, found that even the sentries couldn't keep their eyes open, and he let his slumbering brigade get some much-needed rest as he himself stood guard. At dawn, the men were on the road again. This time for a six-mile hike to the Manassas Gap Railroad Depot at Piedmont. There they were loaded aboard freight cars and transported the remaining thirty-four miles to Manassas Junction. We won't get into the details of the first battle of Manassas, since, as y'all will recall, we've already covered the fighting there back in an earlier story arc. But we will just remind you that the Confederate victory there was due, in no small part, to the presence of Johnston's reinforcements from the valley, and to the initiative shown by certain Confederate brigade commanders, including Jackson, who didn't wait for orders but marched their men toward the sound of the guns on the rebel army's embattled left. And of course, there under a scorching sun, as he made his critical stand on Henry Hill, Stonewall Jackson gained his famous nickname. In effect, the battle at First Manassas completed the military education of Thomas Jackson that had begun on his first day at the United States Military Academy. Like so many other Civil War commanders on both sides, Jackson's thinking early in the war was derived from the lessons he had been taught at West Point and from his experiences in the field during the Mexican-American War. Those lessons stressed, among other things, that infantry attacks. Be brought to victorious climax by a vigorous bayonet charge. That tactic had served the American infantry well against the Mexican army, whose slow rate of fire and relatively short effective range of their smoothbore muskets allowed the Americans to rush in and finish off the enemy with cold steel. As Jackson's military hero Zachary Taylor ungrammatically put it, quote, "My orders was to make free use of the bayonet." The use of the cold steel appealed to Jackson, and he passionately believed in the bayonet. At first, Manassas, when General Bernard B. lamented that the Union forces seemed to be carrying the day, Jackson responded, quote, "Sir, we will give them the bayonet." And at Henry Hill, as his men counterattacked the Yankees, Jackson exhorted them to quote, "Fire and give them the bayonet, and when you charge, yell like furies." End quote. Thus was born the famous Rebel Yell, but in fact the day of the bayonet was ending. It was being rendered all but obsolete by the vastly increased range and killing power of rifled muskets, which made it possible to cut down charging troops before they could come to close quarters and apply their cold steel to the enemy. Moreover, even on those infrequent occasions when soldiers would engage in close quarters combat. It seems many men chose to forego the bayonet in favor of bashing their opponent with a clubbed musket. For all in all, bayonet wounds were relatively rare in Civil War battles, according to medical records. John B. Gordon, who became one of the Confederacy's hardest fighting commanders, had nothing but scorn for the bayonet. He wrote of how quote. The bristling points and the glitter of bayonets were fearful to look upon, as they were leveled in front of a charging line, but they were rarely reddened with blood. End quote. Gordon, like many other officers, recognized during the course of the Civil War that the bayonet's impact was mainly psychological. In fact, he said that the bayonet's best use was quote. To impress the soldier's imagination, as the loud sounding and ludicrous gongs are supposed to stiffen the backs and steady the nerves of the soldiers of China. End quote. Stonewall Jackson, however, was not alone in remaining excessively devoted to the bayonet, but in abundant compensation, he was able to take fullest advantage of other tactics, such as his wholesome respect for the flank attack as an alternative to the frontal charge. To Jackson, the enemy's flank was endlessly inviting, and as mentioned before, he was obsessed with the idea of using surprise as a tactical weapon. He declared, quote, "Always mystify, mislead, and surprise the enemy if possible. The other rule is never fight against heavy odds if, by any possible maneuvering, 
you can hurl your own force on only a part and that the weakest part of your enemy and crush it. End quote. And as we'll see in the Shenandoah Valley, Stonewall Jackson would have plenty of opportunity to mystify and mislead Union forces as he conducted his brilliant war of maneuver. The 1st Brigade, encamped on farmland not far from the stream known as Bull Run, gathered in formation on the morning of November 4, 1861. The 1,800 men present stood waiting for long moments, then into the clearing ambled a small, scruffy horse and his equally scruffy rider, and the men snapped to attention. The general reined little sorrel to a halt and prepared to address the silent ranks. As a rule, he avoided speaking in general, unless absolutely necessary, and he disliked speaking before large groups in particular. For almost a decade before the present war, he had taught at the Virginia Military Institute as a professor of natural and experimental science and as an instructor of artillery tactics, and his classroom lectures had been notorious for their mind-numbing dullness. He had once been overwhelmed by embarrassment when, as a deacon of his Presbyterian church in Lexington, he had been called upon to lead prayers. Yet as he addressed the brigade that bore his name, Stonewall, he spoke with a certain stiff eloquence. Officers and men of the 1st Brigade, you do not expect a speech from me. I come to bid you a heartfelt goodbye. This brigade was formed at Harper's Ferry, and the command of it assigned to me. You have endured hard marches, the exposure and privations of the bivouac, like men and patriots. You are the brigade which turned the tide of battle on Manassas Plains, and there again for yourself imperishable honor, and your names will be handed down with honor attached in future history. At that Stonewall Jackson stopped as if done, but then, caught up in a surge of emotion, he flung his reins on his horse's neck, rose up in his stirrups, and stretched out his right hand in a gesture of blessing. He cried out, You were the first brigade in the army of the Shenandoah, the first brigade in the army of the Potomac, the first brigade in the second corps, and are the first brigade in the hearts of your generals. I hope that you will be the first brigade in this, our second struggle for independence, and in the future, on the fields on which the Stonewall Brigade are engaged, I expect to hear of crowning deeds of valor and of victories gloriously achieved. May God bless you all. Farewell. After his stirring farewell to the Stonewall Brigade, Jackson set out for Winchester to take charge of the Confederate forces in the Shenandoah. With two aides, he rode about five miles to Manassas Junction, where they boarded a train heading west through the Blue Ridge Mountains. After descending into the Shenandoah Valley, the train passed through the village of Front Royal and ten miles later skirted the northern end of Massanutten Mountain. At dusk, Jackson and his companions finally reached the little town of Strasburg. Despite the late hour and the wearying train ride, Jackson refused to spend the night there. His small party started north on horseback and riding down the valley turnpike covered the remaining 18 miles to Winchester before midnight. In all of the Shenandoah Valley, no place was to be fought for more fiercely and frequently than Winchester, the pleasant town that was, among other things, the hub for nine important roadways. Confederate control of Winchester and of the valley offered the rebels the inviting possibility of invasions into Maryland or Pennsylvania, or of a movement to threaten Washington. It also provided a base for raids against the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. Conversely, federal occupation of Winchester would provide a staging point for incursions up the valley, enhance the security of western Maryland and central Pennsylvania, and promise greater protection for the B&O. As an astounding consequence of its position as the key to the valley, Winchester would change hands no fewer than 72 times during the Civil War. And it was there, early on the morning of November 5, 1861, that newly promoted Major General Thomas Jonathan Jackson established his headquarters and notified Richmond that he had assumed command of the 6,000-square-mile district. 
means it's time for this episode's book recommendation. And our recommendation this time is Rebel Yell, The Violence, Passion, and Redemption of Stonewall Jackson by S.C. Gwynn. This is a relatively recent biography of Jackson. It was published in 2014, and it immediately became very popular. And it's easy to see why. Uh, Gwynn narrates Stonewall's story in fine style and offers a very sympathetic portrait of Jackson. Uh, And just as an aside, but Gwynn's account of Second Manassas is outstanding and well worth checking out. You can find Rebel Yell by S.C. Gwynn and all of our other book recommendations in a handy list at the podcast website, which is www.civilwarpodcast.org. We have a couple of new members of the Strawfoot Brigade to thank this week, Jeffrey and Will. Thank you, gentlemen. And within the next week, we'll have the next members episode done. And with that show, we'll look at the surrender of New Orleans and its subsequent occupation by federal forces under Beast Butler. All right. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Civil War, 1861 to 1865, a history podcast. Rich and I do hope you'll join us again next time when we continue with Stonewall Jackson's story. But until then, take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye.